from. Justin, you have been looking at real structures here and possibilities for what dark matter might consist of. Um, explain. Yeah, so I've been working on this theory in which uh, dark matter actually uh, forms a superfluid state. So a superfluid, I don't know if we have maybe an animation of that, but uh, so we know of superfluids uh, in the laboratory. The most famous example is liquid helium. And uh, it's, a, it's, to my opinion, the most striking manifestation of quantum mechanics. When you take liquid helium and you cool it down at sufficiently low temperature, what happens is instead of forming a solid, like normal fluids would, it stays, a, it stays a fluid all the way to absolute zero temperature. And this may, so here we see the, the animation. So you see uh, at high enough temperature, it's bubbling, 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 and then you bring it down to the critical temperature, and all of, all of a sudden its manifestation becomes completely different. And that is quantum mechanics. Now, at this point, the superfluid state is reached, and the helium atoms are no longer functioning as individual independent entities, but they're really in unison. And so now you might think, okay, why would I think uh, that dark matter is this crazy type of stuff? Well, the, the first thing to say is that uh, it's not that crazy. Um, all you need to have a, a superfluid state, people do it with atoms in the laboratory, you need two things. You need to have a lot of these guys, a lot of atoms, dense, densely packed, and you need very cold temperatures. And dark matter, not the WIMPs, but you know, some other form of dark matter can satisfy both those things. And the idea that I had is that if dark matter forms a superfluid, then as we said, they no longer behave like these individually moving, randomly moving particles. They behave coherently uh, in unison. And what the theory we developed is that, in particular, one of the excitations that the superfluid can have are sound waves, phonons, the same kind of sound waves that allow you to hear me. And those sound waves could mediate the type of force that uh, Stacy is talking about. So, of course, it's a speculative idea, but it does combine, on the one hand, the successes of dark matter for the, the cosmic microwave background and large-scale structure, while attempting to explain the properties of galaxies that Stacy was talking about within some unified framework. Wouldn't a superfluid, though, in places in the universe where there is high energy, wouldn't it condense and show itself in some way? So very nice. So, uh, so maybe I can address this cluster yeah. story, because that's very nice. So it also explains, so one thing that Stacy mentioned was, OK, this Milgram formula works well in galaxies, and what happens with bullet clusters, and what happens in galaxy clusters. So one thing that is special to galaxy clusters is that they're very massive. And as a result, dark matter particles in them would be moving around much faster. And what that would mean from the point of view of a superfluid is that, in fact, they're moving so fast that their energy, their kinetic energy, is such that they're above the transition. So they're behaving really like normal particles as opposed to superfluid. So that's one way in the model in which you distinguish between large objects like clusters and galaxies. So they sneakily become ordinary mass without? They become sneakily ordinary, and they become, for reasons I won't get into, but they also sneakily become ordinary in the solar system, where you don't necessarily want to mess around with ordinary gravity. All right. Um, and. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so dark matter is actually sneaky matter. It is sneaky matter. Yeah, a sneaky superfluid. 